I used to deliver on a paper route when I was 13. It was that sort of old school route where I'd hustle every morning around 6 a.m. with a satchel, dropping off the daily paper to houses. It was a pretty cool gig, simple and pretty much exactly what you'd expect. The one lame part about the job was that it was rain or shine. No matter the weather, even if it was pitch black with a blizzard, the paper was getting delivered. That's probably why they used to hire kids back in the day. It was easier to pressure them to go, and they had to walk that route either way. One day, I was dropping off papers as usual in the morning. It was winter and still dark. These were my favorite shifts because it felt like the whole world hadn't quite turned on yet. It was cool seeing all the homes nice and cozy, maybe a wisp or two of smoke still escaping the chimneys. It's just nostalgic for no reason, maybe because of the holidays. I slogged on through the dark. The few streetlights that guided my route cast dim yellow glares into the snow drifts beneath them. I remember it being extra still and ominous. I would periodically stop between houses to catch my breath, but it was really to survey the neighborhood. I still can't put my finger on it, even to this day, but I remember just feeling weird that morning. Something was off, but not anything I was aware of. All I could do was push on through the cold and get the job done. Shortly after passing a house at the end of a cul-de-sac, I heard two loud pops, followed by a third a minute later. I grew up around guns and knew that sound, but I just carried on with my route. I figured it was someone getting their car started and the exhaust backfired or something. I'd seen that happen to my dad's truck before and other cars around town, so I knew it was a possibility. In my 13-year-old brain, it was way more likely than three consecutive gunshots. I waited to say anything to anyone until later on that morning. It's just one of those things you don't want to mention because you don't know the gravity of the situation. When I mentioned what I'd heard, my parents immediately told me that it was all in my head. It probably was just a car backfiring. It did put me at ease and I just went on with my day. That confirmed what I was so desperate to believe. Later that morning, my neighborhood was full of police and news vans centered around the house. They were clamoring for neighbors or anyone who'd been around the cul-de-sac that morning. My parents told me to stay inside, but the truth is that I would have never gone to speak to them. Just like when I hesitated to tell my parents, I felt like I was doing something awful when I told them about what I heard. It felt disrespectful, strange, and very ominous. It felt wrong. I didn't know every single neighbor that we had at the time, but if any of them were dead, I wouldn't have the stomach to hear the news. That was a heavy realization too, that the paper boy knew first. Maybe that is why I hesitated. I would be speaking about people I didn't know at all, and it felt very sad to me. You may be able to tell the story gave me a lifetime of very quiet, suffocating PTSD. We got the full story as it was pieced together throughout the week. The man who lived in the house was older, at least older than my dad, and had been a local for a very long time. He had a son who was in the army, and had been away for some time. He went through a deployment of some kind. I don't know the exact military details, but he eventually came home to visit his father. When he arrived back at home, he wasn't alone. He brought another guy with him, and then proceeded to come out to his father as gay. The other guy was his boyfriend. No one really knew any of the details beyond that, other than how the visit concluded. The dad shot and killed them both that morning, then immediately turned the gun on himself. This is all speculation, but I imagine it was a cold visit for them, even colder with a half foot of snow, burying the house and clogging up the streets. It was probably the morning they were planning on heading back to the base or wherever they lived. The father just couldn't take it. Couldn't leave them like that. It's a tragedy and impacted the entire community, but no one more than me. I didn't deliver another paper for a while. Everyone was pretty understanding as to why even the newspaper editor. The talk of the town, but for me, it was a memory. It's like I was the fourth man in the room when it happened or something. Be good to yourselves out there. I was driving home with my family after visiting my sister who lives the town over. I was learning how to drive and had a pretty good handle on it. My stepdad let me drive there to get used to winter highway driving, so naturally, I drove back as well. 
The storm wasn't supposed to start until later that evening, so we thought we would be fine. The trip turned out okay, but I really don't know what anyone was thinking when they let me drive. I had literally no experience behind the wheel, and here we are barreling down a highway with a pending snowburst. At the time, we were joking about how this would be the last trip we'd ever take. It started snowing when we left, which wasn't terrible because I was capable of driving in the snow, but it picked up fast. We had just left town. We were maybe 10 minutes into the drive before it came a complete whiteout. I'm driving in the left lane. It's 8 p.m. in the middle of January, so it's pitch black and peak winter where I live. The falling snow was blinding. It wasn't like going light speed, watching all the snow drift by on the windshield. There were so many flakes filling the glass and with the headlights bouncing off them, I couldn't see anything at all. It was caking up along the edges of the visor by the inch. Not to mention these are Canadian highways. The only lights you're getting for a long stretch are going to be your headlights. I was doing my absolute best not to panic and was shocked at the level of calm I was able to muster. My stepdad was doing his best to guide me and try to find a safe place to pull over, but the winds were blowing snow everywhere so we couldn't see the ditches or the lines. I had two worries. One, I'm in the left lane, so if I pull over, I might not know how far exactly to go and might throw us into a ditch that's completely filled with snow. Two, I can't see the lines at all, and if I keep driving, I might not stay in the correct lane because of that. The only thing I could do was keep driving until I was absolutely certain it was safe to pull over. I was using the rumble strips as my only guide, since the tires were able to get to a slight feel for them. I was doing something like maybe 45 and a 75. My stepdad is guiding me to the road his parents live on, so we can have a better place to stop. We passed maybe eight cars in the ditch between my sister's town and my grandparents' road. My speed only descended from there as the storm didn't let up. The sky only seemed to get darker and as the snow started to freeze along the highways, the tires started to spin a little. The faster I went, the less control I had of the car. At some point the road was completely covered, and the rumble strips weren't noticeable anymore either, so I was just going off instinct. I ended up hitting a sheet of ice at an awkward angle, and spun out into the oncoming lane. I managed to regain control of the car, saw faint headlights, and said, yep, we're in the wrong lane, shouldn't be here at all. Thankfully and quickly, I safely moved us back over into the proper lane. My mom's in the back seat freaking the fuck out because we just spun out, and now I'm making the decisions behind the wheel. It's not like she could crawl up into the driver's seat and just take over. Somehow, my stepdad is surprisingly less chill than me, but trying to keep his cool, doing everything he can not to grab the wheel in a panic. I can barely see an inch from the front of the car. Finally, we managed to get to his parents' road and pull over. We got out and switched places, and when I stepped out of the vehicle, the snow was up to my shins. I ended up staying the night at my grandparents' house because there was no way in hell we were making it back home alive even if we tried. Found out about 15 minutes after getting in that they closed off the highway due to poor conditions. We had to dig our way out of the house the next morning to go home. I got to stay home from school that day since I was stuck out of town. Meanwhile, everyone else had to go in. It was my first winter with my learners and my first blizzard drive. If we had a smaller car, we would have never made it to my grandparents to begin with. I was terrified, but I was not going to let my parents know that, especially with my mom in the back seat very scared. I never should have driven that night, but it helped me to learn how to handle those kind of drives later on, and I became a better driver because of it. It was a fucking trip though, that's for sure, and I'll never forget it. I live on an island in Maine that's an hour ferry ride out from civilization. The boat comes three days a week typically, but there's a lot of times they cancel due to the weather. It's a very mild trip, not much to talk about aside from the very nice views that you get on both shores. It's the type of stereotype from a Stephen King novel, isolated, watery depths, little quaint townships. It's cute, but for certain lifestyles, it can be pretty inconvenient. 
One winter, my best friend was having a bachelor party weekend that I couldn't miss. It wasn't an option. We were getting together for unspeakable debauchery, the kind of shit you only see in movies. Now it's Maine in the middle of January. There's mountains of snow and violent wind swells, but my car time is limited. It's the boat and the plane that I'm worried about. When I check both statuses, they're green. Everyone is operating as normal. I load my bags and navigate the icy roadways and pay the parking fee. Just took one look at the white caps, has me scratching my head. Did I read the status wrong? There's no way a ferry is working in these conditions, but lo and behold, the status held up. It was still green on the website. The person that I call confirmed it as green. I could actually see the ferry returning from its previous trip. It rocked a bit on the roaring froth, but actually served to calm my nerves. It didn't seem to be as affected as I thought it would be. I'm not a sea captain, sue me. The people arriving offload and seemed to be in good spirits from what I could see. I made sure to scan them for the reactions, ghost white faces, big buggy eyes, clenched fist, or over emotional. No one seemed disturbed by their voyage. I doubled down and boarded the moment I was able to. Again, missing this bachelor weekend event was not an option. I drowned in the depths of the ocean before that happened. Needless to say, that damn captain should have canceled that day. We parted from the port and cruised uneventfully. There wasn't very many of us on board. I played on my phone while others made casual small talk. People going to the mainland for events like me. Others for grocery trips and supplies. As we all collectively settled in, the ferry tipping back and forth. It tips one direction a little too far. Everyone gets quiet as they notice it. And it goes back in the other direction and has the same effect. We're starting to rock. Beyond the viewing windows, I can see a towering white cap colliding out in front of us. The water is beginning to lap over the sides of the boat. It's a complete whiteout in all directions, and land is nowhere to be seen. The captain makes an announcement over the comm system that things are rougher than normal, but assured us everything was fine. He insisted we all stay calm, stay alert, and put our faith in him. He also said we needed to stay seated. That last part deflated a bit of the morale from us as we were watching the swells jump over the sides of the boat, some of them easily over six feet. Strike what I said earlier. Thank God I'm not a sea captain. We did the back and forth rocking for the rest of the trip, dipping a little more each time. The waves tossed us in any direction they pleased. During one teeter, the pressure from the water sent a huge crack through one of the viewing windows. All of those passengers had to evacuate to other seats, but they had to time their movements with the rocking of the ship. The first people that got up in a panic were thrown to the floor so hard it knocked the wind out of them. They waited for the boat to tip the other way and then bolted for a different seat. The crack continued to get worse, but the windows never gave in. The staff promised that it was a tempered glass with double pane. They went so far to say that it could stop a low caliber bullet. I looked at the ferocious ocean beyond the glass and laughed at them. Who cares if it can stop at a 22? Can it dam up the Atlantic? No, that glass was nothing in comparison. I guess looking back, maybe the crew was just as shocked needed to tell themselves something for comfort. It didn't end though. The captain said we were lagging a bit but still making good time, which no one reacted. We are too busy trying not to vomit on each other from the nauseating voyage. I started to doubt the legendary bachelor party and regretted tempting mother nature. She didn't care. If she did anything, she laughed at me. The boat rocked again, but this time, it tipped so far that I had to put my foot on the wall next to me to stop myself from falling into it. The wall became the floor, and then the floor became a wall. Fortunately, I sat solo at the start of the trip, and no one had gotten close to me during the foyer. No one came crashing down on me from further up the row. I imagined if there had been, well, anything to toss about. Carts, luggage, whatever. It would have been like getting stoned to death every time the ferry shifted. It started to clear up after that, and thankfully so, because we couldn't have handled much more back there. We were inches from being tossed right through those windows and into the frigid waters beyond them. It would have been worse than anything I could imagine. The glass would absolutely annihilate our bodies as we passed through it, and the sucking vacuum of the ocean 
would have ripped us through the froth and debris, into raging currents. After that, who knows? Drowning in water so cold, it feels like ice cubes in your lungs? Having every bone broken by the force of waves and outright freezing to death? The possibilities were bleak, but never came to fruition. We made it to shore, docked, and I even made my flight on time. That journey was almost as bad, but that's a story for another time. This happened when I was 15, near Algonquin Park. My father and I were driving up to our cottage in the middle of winter. I was always so amazed by the beauty of that park, and had grown up enjoying the beauty of it every single summer. The cottage was on a large lake, about 30 minute drive from the nearest town. There were probably thousands of cottages on the lake. During the summer, the lake and the town's population tripled. It was cottage country, so people would spend all summer enjoying the lake and warm nights around the campfires their family and friends. I spent every summer out there growing up. It still brings fond memories of sunshine, laughter, and the sounds of motorboats on the lake. But the winters are different. The people that didn't live there year-round would venture back home to the city life, leaving the area mostly deserted, with cottages boarded up for the winter. There were a few people that still frequently would come up every couple of months for a few days or so. But for the most part, the lake was silent during the winters, and the town was just filled with the locals. The beautiful pine trees are always covered with snow, making the forest quiet. Our cottage was on a dead end road. There was about 20 other cottages on the road, with ours being somewhat in the middle. The cottages were quite spaced out. However, with our closest neighbors being too far away to see through the trees, my dad needed to head up to the cottage to do some painting that my mom had been bugging him to do. This was at the end of February, so it was a long weekend. I tagged along so he wouldn't be alone and we could spend some quality time together. It was about a five hour drive from home, but turned out to be an eight hour drive due to the heavy snow. It had gotten dark out quite early. It was around midnight as we drove through the park. It was deadly quiet and pitch black except for the headlights of the car. We finally passed through the park with only 30 minutes left to get to the cottage. It stopped snowing and we were both eager to get there. As we turned onto the familiar road, I remember my dad cursing. It hadn't been plowed yet. This wasn't surprising, however. It probably wouldn't be later until that day when we would even see a snow plow. As we drove down the road, I noticed there was a fresh set of tire tracks. The Smiths must be up for the weekend, my dad had said. All of a sudden, as we drove around the bend, following the tire tracks, the headlights of a car shown on a white van that was parked on the side of the road. It was almost hidden by the fast trees that were covered with snow. What the? My dad mumbled. As we drove past that white van, I remember looking back through the back window and very clearly seeing two figures in the front seat, illuminated by our retreating taillights. I told my dad this, and he shrugged. Ah, maybe they're lost. I nodded, but couldn't help to think about how it was a dead-end road. Why would they feel the need to park right there? As we pulled into our driveway and started bringing our stuff in, I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. I couldn't stop thinking about the van and why it was there, with two people just sitting in the dark in the middle of the night. It spooked me so much that I begged my dad to let me sleep upstairs with him, instead of downstairs in the room my sister and I usually shared. It had big windows with no blinds that looked out into the blackness of that forest and my 15-year-old self was already scared of the dark, even without seeing that white van. It wasn't that big of a deal when my sister was there, but not tonight. As my dad got ready for bed, I sat in the living room reading a book. My dad had turned off all the lights. I was just using a small lamp next to the couch to try to get through one last chapter before I went to bed. It was so quiet that I could almost hear my ears ringing. I also started to get the feeling that I was being watched. The living room had two large windows, again with no curtains, that overlooked the lake. It was black except for a light or two from the cottages across the lake. I shut off the lamp and got up. Now that that cottage was dark, the moon was shining brightly, illuminating the snow. It was beautiful. I walked toward the window to get a better look. Movement caught my eye. 
And I remember my heart dropping as I saw two figures down by the back porch below the window, barely hidden by the surrounding trees. I immediately dropped to the floor and crawled towards the bedroom where my dad was. He was sleeping. My heart was in my throat. I wasn't sure if they'd seen me or not yet. I woke my dad up, and by the time he got to the window, the two figures were gone. Where I had seen those figures, two sets of footprints were in the snow that led back to the front of the cottage and then back down the driveway. I begged my dad not to go outside. He double-checked the locks and turned on the porch lights, hopefully to scare any of them off. My dad wasn't as freaked out as I was, but still set the alarm before he headed back to bed. I remember being very freaked out, and I lay there all night next to my dad, terrified I'd look out the window and see someone staring right back at me. The next morning, my dad went outside and confirmed there were two sets of footprints leading from the road behind our cottage, and then back around the front of the cottage, and then back up to the road. There were tire marks that showed the vehicle had turned around, then got back up to the main road. My dad guessed they were probably looking to break in and steal stuff, as it was the middle of winter. Not too many people were up at the lake, but they knew we were there. They would have seen our tire tracks leading to our cottage, and my dad's car parked out front. They also had to have seen the lamp I'd turned on to read, and or seeing it go off. My dad didn't have an answer to any of this, and after much back and forth, he called the non-emergency line and reported it. Apparently, there had been some break-ins in the area, and some stuff had been stolen from other cottages that were boarded up for the winter. But again, I still wonder to this day, why would they be interested in stealing from a house that clearly had people still inside? I was driving up to a ski hill after a snowstorm. Not having a great amount of money at the time, I hadn't invested in winter tires. Anyone who lives in a snowy region knows the value of these things. They can get an average vehicle out of a less than desirable situation. They aren't going to get you anywhere, but they'll keep you out of the ditches if you're careful. There's a tractor trailer in front of me, a car to my left and another car behind. This is almost the worst place a driver can be during snowy driving. My car was at the nexus of any trouble that was going to happen, so I did my best to stay sharp and focused. After a while though, I started to zone out. It's natural for us once we get relaxed and comfortable. Nothing chaotic had happened for a good 20 minutes or so. I just chilled out like anyone does as they're driving. Something shifted in the passenger seat, so I took my eyes off the road for a moment. I'm talking about a split second correction. I didn't even have to reach over or move anything. It didn't matter. Snow is merciless. Without the snow tires, my bald little city slickers were out of control instantly. I'd only made it as far as I did because I was following the trailer tracks in front of me. Just the faintest amount of slush sent me sailing over a crash course for a certain death. The right wheels crossed over into the shoulder and lost traction. The car drifted to the right onto the shoulder. I was hoping this would be the end of the situation, crash into the guardrail, sustain some body damage, and get my dumbass back on the road. It wasn't ideal, but it was better than spinning out. I took my foot off the gas and just tried to coast. No brakes, just open steering. Applying either pedal would have contributed to the chaos and lack of control, sending me into a collision at a faster speed. I would have gone into that guardrail, but the snow had piled up against it, forming a natural curb that my car bounced off of. I stared in pure shock and terror as the visuals before me started to turn the other direction. I passed through those tracks that I was following, but I didn't have the reaction time to pull out of the slide. Between my lack of reacting and the impact of the snow drift, my car still, without proper traction, started naturally drifting left. The truck ahead of me began to slow, but I didn't want to break for fear of losing what traction I had. Now, there's the option of potentially slamming into the back of his trailer, going through the windshield and maybe even getting decapitated. So my car makes its way sideways across the lane, and I prepare for whatever is going to happen when I sideswipe the vehicle one lane over. We didn't make contact, but I cut sharply into his lane before sliding back into mine. We came within inches of touching fenders, but he had a more equipped rig, 
and was able to maneuver away from me. The humiliation of almost killing a stranger and maybe even his family brought me back into the moment. Just as I hit the center of the lane, my tires managed to grip the road again and I resumed moving straight forward, tapping my brakes at this point to prevent myself from rear-ending the truck which was now right in my face. The car seems to be under my control again and even resumes accelerating through the snow. It feels like an eternity typing it all out like this, but the whole event couldn't have taken more than a few seconds. Car collisions. I have an uncanny way of dilating time and stretching events out into the longest possible form. It has something to do with the real-time reaction to those events as they happen, and watching them either improve or worsen in rapid fashion. In the end, the only thing that my car made contact with other than the road was that snowbank, and that didn't even leave a mark. I escaped very, very luckily, and was grateful as I could be. It really could have gone south, not just for me, but for those other drivers. Had I killed someone else, it would have affected me forever. And yes, when I got home from the ski hill, I bought myself some snow tires, and haven't gone without them since that trip. I didn't live there, but I spent two months helping my grandfather shut up his second farm. He was selling the buildings and most of the land to live full-time on his bigger farm up in Maine. They knew I needed work, and I went immediately from Baltimore up to them in my shitty Ford Focus. The work itself was lax, but tedious to start, mostly moving animals and their food, loading up trailer after trailer of chickens, pigs, cows, and one load of even horses. This was my first job in a while with livestock, and I was glad to be back tending to them. There's just something cool about working with animals. You get to know their personalities and quirks, and they can never talk shit to you. It's a rewarding exchange, and it's always rewarding at the end of a day, knowing they're all cared for. So flash forward about a month. We've moved most of the animals, thankfully, when a huge blizzard hit. It wasn't just a blizzard, though. His property rests at the bottom of a soft two-mile slope, and by soft... I mean a gentle slope that's very, very gradually declines until it reaches his property. In snow country, these types of terrain features are the worst. The snow cascades down the hillside in sheets until there isn't enough to slide anymore. The drifts were 20 feet high in some spots to give you a picture. The snow was as tall as two outlying barns and far taller than any of the stables or coops. We were using barrels burning wood and tires to keep the area between the house and barn clear. There would be a blazing barrel every eight feet or so, and we had to keep them going because they were impossible to restart. If the snow got in and doused it, the whole barrel had to be replaced. Rolling around an 800 degree steel barrel isn't as fun as it sounds. The wind was harder than I've ever seen, and the family was saying they've never seen it like this in at least 50 years. If you were going through a door that opened up to the outside, it required both arms to push it open. You had to protect your eyes and face because the wind shock could freeze the water in your eyes faster than you could close them. It happened to all of us and it was one of the worst, most indescribable pains of my life. Me and my uncle were taking turns filling a can of gas in the barn to keep the generators running. It was the only thing keeping us alive, frankly. The wood stoves and burning barrels were a nice addition, but the electricity was the real godsend. I felt like I was living in a different century, running around keeping everything going in shifts, wondering when it all would end. There was nothing to be done but the work at hand. Not long into the blizzard, my uncle fell and broke his leg. He was out there alone when it happened, and I didn't think to go check on him until he didn't return with the gas. I bundled up and pushed through the frost and wind until I reached that barn. I got inside and slammed the door behind me and turned to see him lying there in the mud and ice. He told me he'd yelled for a while, but realized there was no way anyone could hear him over the wind, so he just waited. I got up and found him a walking stick, helped him get back inside. Fortunately, his sister, my aunt, was there helping with the move, and just so happened to be a doctor, like a real one. She set his leg and got him splinted as well as she could. This was a pretty crazy development. Now, almost all of the hour-to-hour -hour labor fell on me. I set about grabbing wood and filling all the barrels, then stocking up the house too. I marched back and forth, armload after armload until I couldn't go anymore. 
The ice was starting to gloss over my eyes and my mouth. I thawed by the fire for five minutes and then went back to it. We needed more than wood. We needed that sweet, sweet gasoline. I stomped out three more trips for a total of six gallons of gas before I'd given up. We were stocked for half an evening, but my fingers and toes were threatening to develop frostbite. I wasn't willing to lose any part of my body for what that hourly they were paying me. Then Grandpa came over to ask me a favor. One more trip, out to the barn to make sure everything was sealed properly. I was still dressed, defrosting by the fire, so I said okay, and then made one more trip into the storm. It was snowing again, piling up on those 20-foot drifts. They towered in the distance, overlooking the property like great white ogres. I get to the barn and everything is copacetic. The fuel line is closed, the lights are off, nothing is out of place. The only thing I notice that's weird is the silence. For some reason, I can't hear any of the wind on the roof or against the back wall. It had been howling for a day and a half, two days at that point, and on top of that, I could still see that the wind was blowing. Why couldn't I hear it? I thought something was wrong with me, maybe a weird symptom of hyperthermia, maybe something even worse, and my nervous system was shutting down one sense at a time. I didn't know what else to think. Then I thought my eyes were messing with me, and I was getting vertigo. First the joints appeared as if they were twisting in place, starting to lean. I looked at them in awe, like I was having an acid flashback. Now I was certain something was wrong with my brain. Heat stroke existed, so I started to wonder, maybe there was such a thing as a cold stroke. That's when I heard a noise. Finally something normal. It wasn't a normal sound though. It was a pop or a chirp or maybe a snap. Something quick and loud. I looked back up to the walls and found that the joists were still now, but the boards of the walls were rippling. A window exploded above me, and I realized what was going on. I couldn't hear the wind because the snow had completely covered the barn. Those drifts piled up so high and so thick that they blocked any lighter wind from touching it. Now, all that weight was starting to move, and the barn was going with it. The structure was seconds from collapsing. I left everywhere where it was and sprinted for the exit. I dove through, landing hard on the ice and skated on my chest over to one of those burning barrels. I turned around just in time to watch a 40 foot snowdrift erase the barn from existence. I was expecting an explosive sound for some reason, but the insulation of the snow kept it relatively quiet. Grandpa couldn't believe it when I went inside and told him. We were all in disbelief 30 minutes later when the sun came out and started to burn off the clouds. That was the last winter gig that I ever took. I was pretty new at driving and coming home from work late one night and decided it was the perfect time for my first drive across the lake. I live in Minnesota and this is a huge rite of passage here. It sounds exactly what it is, kids taking their cars across the frozen surface of really big lakes. It's a lot less risky than it sounds, as the surface of the sheet of ice can be up to four or five feet thick. It's a huge solid piece of ice that is almost indestructible, like someone took a rolling pin to an iceberg. Sometimes you'll see a dozen trucks parked in the same vicinity of the ice, tens of thousands of pounds, sitting right on top like it's nothing, and in between them, the fishermen have drilled holes through the surface to get to the water. Even with the additional weight and compromised ice, it still holds strong. I kept this all in mind as I left the earth and rolled out onto the water. It's an uneasy, almost sickening feeling the first few times. It's no different than driving on land when you're behind the wheel, but in your mind, you know there's hundreds of feet of water ready to crush you into nothing just a few feet below the engine. Things were okay for the first few minutes, but as I got closer to the center of the ice, I started getting nervous. It was really hard to see anything except the plowed path in front of me, and I realized I had no idea where I was going to come off the lake at, or if the path even went across the lake at all. That was the only time you heard about things going bad with these lake runs. People could get confused with the directions and cross the lake, but simply proceed into wilderness. It isn't paved or driven through all the way out there, so... Some people would get lost and eventually stuck. 
The other reality is, you might be driving in some tracks that just abruptly stop, and now, you're facing an 8 foot snow wall and there's no way to turn around. You have to back up the entire duration until you hit shore again. So I decided I would just turn around and go home. There was this little area I came up on that I looked like I could flip around in. It wasn't much of a clearing, but the snow wasn't piled up either. I came to a stop, which actually made me more nervous, like the weight was extra heavy now or something. I don't think it matters to the ice if vehicles are moving or not, they either plummet through or they don't. As soon as I backed up off the plowed area to turn around, I was stuck in over a foot of snow, tried putting my floor mat under the tire, which ended up fleeing the mat 20 feet behind me, tried digging out with my snow scraper, the only thing I succeeded in was doing and breaking off a fingernail and causing my finger to start bleeding. This was way before cell phones, so I finally decided I needed to start walking toward home. I was probably at least three or so miles away. That was a weird realization too, just how far out you could be on a lake. It was probably a mile just getting back to shore. I got all the supplies out I could, mostly jackets and things to insulate them with, and I had one crappy red flashlight. And unfortunately for me, the wind chill was about negative 20, and I don't know if you've ever tried to walk across a lake on a windy night but the lake is pretty flat. There's nothing to shield you from the wind. By the time I got off that lake, I was seriously thinking that I was going to die of hypothermia. Not long after I reached an area with houses, and my extremely introverted, shy, socially awkward self bravely decided that I needed to knock on a door and get some help. Someone finally answered. I explained my predicament and asked if I could use their phone. I called home feeling relieved. That help was within reach and enjoying the warmth of the stranger's house now. My younger brother answered. I told him to get dad and he said nope. I told him it wasn't funny, that I needed help, and he hung up on me. I called back but he must have left the phone off the hook because I only got a busy signal. After trying a few more times and feeling increasingly awkward, I decided the only thing I could do was walk the rest of the way home. So I did. My burning hatred of my brother and plans to beat the crap out of him kept me warm. I made it home with only one little spot of frostbite on my finger due to a hole in my glove. My brother got read the riot act by my dad, just as I did for driving onto that lake. The next day, dad drove me back to get my car, which thankfully hadn't been towed. I haven't had any interest on driving on a lake since. A few years ago around Thanksgiving, it snowed a foot overnight. I was homeless at the time, riding my bike trailing a heavy bike cart that had a flat tire. The sun was going down and snow was starting to fall. I was sweating and exhausted because of that flat. I decided I needed to look at the tire. It was too much work trying to pull it through the snow and the slush. I pulled into an empty parking lot, found a little overhang to work under. It was very small barely sticking a foot out from the walls, so it only gave my cover. The bike and the cart were fully exposed. I'm tinkering, looking at the rip in the rubber and decide I really can't do anything with materials on hand. There's a break in the storm. The wind calmed down. The sun is long gone. I decide this place is as good as any, to rest for just a minute, before I start pulling the bike back to the place that I stay at night. What was supposed to be a few minutes of rest turned into four hours of me being completely passed out in this parking lot. The problem was, it started snowing not long after I fell asleep, and I awoke, buried under another six inches. The sweat on my skin and coat liner had turned to frost, and I was sure that I was hyperthermic, or close to it. It took me 30 minutes to fight my way out of the snow blanket. It was heavy, wet, dense, and my muscles were at the point of failure. Even after I uncovered myself, I could barely stand up. I used my handlebars to pull myself up to my feet. The parking lot was barren of any options. There was an office entrance, but even that was blown in with snow. And that's when I saw it. A dumpster. Certainly not one of my proudest moments, but I shambled back to the bike cart, pulled my blanket roll from the interior, and made my way over to the big green can. It was one of those green boxes with a double flip lid top. I threw my blankets in and dove in after them, 
Thankfully, it was just a few bags of garbage and loose cardboard. Nothing disgusting on top. Like I would have cared. It was the only option if I wanted to stay alive. I spent the night in there with the putrid smells and rubbed all the parts of myself that kept falling asleep. The cardboard came in handy to further insulate the lid, fill the gaps that let the wind and snow in. I chalked my bike and belongings up to a loss, even in the storm. I assumed some asshole would cruise by, see my stuff, and roll it right down the road without me. When I cracked my fortress open in the morning, though, I found that I was wrong. The sun was out, my body recovered, and my bike was still right where I left it. That narrow escape was one of the events that ultimately helped me turn my life around. Sometimes rock bottom is actually a catapult. Once when I was in college, I lost the key to my car and I didn't have a spare. It was the middle of winter. I didn't have a choice but to walk to a car dealership six or seven miles from my apartment to get a replacement. In hindsight, this seems like such a weird, desperate avenue to take, literally. I think I used the winter time as an excuse not to ask for a ride, but damn, it was also the best excuse for a ride. Walking in the snow sucks, but I was young, and seven miles didn't sound that far. Let me tell you how wrong I was. This was the most exhausting thing I've ever done. The first mile took my breath away, but after that, each step took noticeably more effort. My energy levels weren't that great to start with, having the stress of no car or key, so I was handicapped from the get-go. The other mistake that I made was not realizing there would be another seven miles waiting for me on the return trip. This really was desperation, not planning out any part of the journey before me. I got there just fine in the early afternoon, but it took a lot longer than I thought to get in a replacement key. The quote they gave me over the phone was way shorter than what they told me in the waiting room. An hour turned into two, and then I didn't hear back from anybody. The sun set, snow started to fall. Finally, someone came out with an envelope with my name on it, two keys, ready for my car. I just needed to navigate the snowy roadways in the dark. I pulled up my flimsy hood up against the wind and snow, but it was completely useless. The gusts cut right through it, and my whole face was frozen numb within the first 10 minutes. My phone said it dropped from 19 degrees to negative 25 degrees. This accounted for the wind chill, which had frozen my scarf stiff. I pulled it inside my jacket to warm up and use it around my face, but it didn't help. I could feel my lips blistering from the temperatures. Another factor presented itself. I forgot my inhaler. It was in my school bag. I start being careful all the way back not to breathe too deeply. My breathing was just about the only thing I had control over, so I actually had to slow down my pace even more just to accommodate my lungs. It was like a death trap for a person like me, having to move slower and slower in plummeting temperatures. I started hearing this strange, tiny clicking noise and realized that the condensation from my breath had settled on my eyelashes and the wind had frozen them, making them clink every time I blinked. I laughed at first, but after hearing it enough, I started to panic. Would my eyelashes break off by the time I got home? Would the frost extend into liquid in my eyeballs and start to freeze them too? I'm getting colder and colder and exerting more and more just to keep going. Eventually, the inevitable asthma attack starts about three blocks from my apartment. It starts as this biting fire, and soon, my lungs are empty and shriveled. It's like someone just hit me in the back with a sledgehammer and knocked the wind completely out of me. Now I'm trying to recover through a straw. It's a panic feeling, and I can't afford to fall into this attack anymore. Somehow, I managed to stagger the rest of the way through. I kept losing track of whether my feet were moving or not. Sometimes I thought I was just standing in place, but when I looked down, I'd be in motion. It was a very weird hallucination. When I finally made it, I knew all I had to do was to get to my inhaler. I knew exactly where it was, I just had to get to it. I climbed the stairs. I opened the door. I collapsed on the couch where I left my bag. Numb fingers fumbled it out, but I only managed one of the required two puffs before the oxygen deprivation rendered me unconscious. I had never passed out before. The involuntary nature of the experience was sickening. My roommates thought I was napping, 
and covered me with a blanket, boots and all. I regained consciousness in the wee hours, weak and wheezing. As I regained coherency, I remembered what had happened. I broke down and sobbed quietly as I could. I could feel the chill in the space between my organs. I was scared to pull my boots off and see what my feet looked like. The one puff had been enough to open my airway a little bit. I used my inhaler again, and though I probably should have gone to the hospital, I just put on a few layers and had a cup of mint tea and then went to bed. My body seemed to be fine, aside from the absolute destroyed muscles in my legs and my chest. There was a throb in my head too, but not enough to get me out of the house again. And then I remembered the keys in the envelope, the whole goal of my mission, my trek through the tundra. In a panic, I fly back to my coat and throw it open, check the interior pocket. There they were, safe and sound. All was right in Winter Wonderland. My roommates were flabbergasted when I told them what had happened the next day. They really thought that I was just deeply asleep. I was very lucky to not have died. So obviously, next time, I'm asking for a ride. I was driving to work during the tail end of a massive snowstorm, or sort of essential food service, but for a college campus. Many of the students who live on campus don't have kitchen in their dorms, or many don't even drive, so lots of them wouldn't eat if we didn't open up. This made us travel up through some pretty insane conditions, but those kids wouldn't eat if we didn't show up. Even restaurants near campus closed during a level three snow emergency inside the city. Anyway, the informal policy for work for these situations is just to make an honest effort if you can, but don't risk your life. I'm one of the few there that has a four wheel drive and I have the biggest vehicle, a crew cab truck. So I drive down to campus and then pick up workers who live nearby that wanted to come in. I'm rolling down the highway at a decent clip, only one lane that had been sort of plowed. I'd scoot over to the far left and kicked it into four wheel. Not many cars out, it's still snowing and things are going pretty smooth and I'm feeling good. Never fall for that overconfidence though. That's what brings on the trouble. Once you're confident, get relaxed and after that it's all over. You stop making decisions and start reacting. That's when you forfeit control. I'm doing about 40 miles per hour when I notice a pair of headlights coming up behind me. Faster than they should. It has to be an emergency vehicle, right? I, I couldn't really tell. I signal to move over to the middle lane just in case they're starting to ease over. The headlights are getting closer, way faster than I'm comfortable with. It's close enough now that I can tell it's a big, lifted SUV. Now my farm truck is pretty big, but I'm not keen on wrecking it, and I certainly don't want to tangle with something that's that big in this weather. I assume it has four-wheel drive as well, but what a jackass. There's no reason to be driving this fast on ice and snow. I let off the pedal and start inching to the far right lane just about the time he's going to overtake me, just as we're heading onto a bridge. Something went wrong for the guy. That ice got him, and he started fishtailing. I'm ever so gingerly towing the brake, trying to slow the best I can without risking the same fate for myself. I know without a doubt in my mind, this driver is a lost cause, maybe even a fatality. I'm trying to create as much distance as possible when he collides with something. Crashes in the snow have a nasty habit of pulling the cars around them into the mix as well. There's just too many extra factors with all the sliding and the embankments. The SUV loses all traction, spins, and goes sliding over across my lane, missing me by inches. Windshield facing windshield. It was close enough that we locked eyes for a split second, and I could see the terror in them. Then he spun away from me, into the darkness and off the road. He was exactly what I expected. Young, either arrogant or ignorant, to how to drive in the snow. Maybe there was an emergency somewhere, but who knows. We would both just crossed the bridge as this happened. He went flying off the highway right where the guardrail ended, sailing into some trees. I saw the branches shake and the snow fall with a whoosh, then nothing but the faint glow of the taillights. Now I had to call this idiot in, and I can't tell you how common it is for some dummy driver to send their car sailing off a roadway, snow or shine, only to never be found. Calling it in is the move, 
because the person that just crashed might be unconscious and there's no way to get to them. They could wake up later with no memory of where they were, and even if they do remember, sometimes the crash can rearrange the contents of a car. Their phone might not be where they left it. Either way, that dumbass not only wrecked driving like an idiot, but almost came inches from taking me with him. I saw a couple of cars behind me slowing down and pulling off, so I called 911 and kept right on to work. My butt cheeks were clenched so tight, I thought I was going to have to get someone to pry me off the truck seat with a crowbar. It's not always the ice and snow that'll get you into trouble. It's the damn idiots you share the roads with, who don't know how to drive safe in it at all. So this story takes place 11 years ago. I was a senior in high school at the time, but it's the single most mind-boggling thing I've ever experienced. It's also important to note that it happened in mid-December. I live in Iowa, and the winter's here, yet extremely cold at night. Like if you get stuck outside, you will die kinda cold. Plus, the snowfall makes everything dead silent. You can hear anything and everything inside the house and even immediately outside of it. Me and my best friend were hanging out in my family's walkout basement just having a boring winter night playing some video games. We were also the only ones at home. The reason it was just us is because my mother went straight from work to the bar to grab a few drinks with coworkers. so me and my friend thought it would be a good idea to break into the family wine and just live a little. As we were sitting there opening up the first bottle, I hear the door to the garage door open and then slam shut. I immediately go, oh shit, and start looking for places to hide the bottle. My friend then says, I thought you said your mom was supposed to be out all night. She was, I replied. Then I heard a few heavy stomps and hear my mother yell out, anyone home? I yell back upstairs, yeah, we're just, we're just hanging out in the basement, mom. I hear a few more steps move from the garage door toward the stairs and then she yells out again, hey, can you come help me with something? I need you up here. I reply back while frantically trying to find a good place to hide the wine bottle. Yeah, just, just give me a minute, mom. Then there was silence for another 20 seconds. Anyone down there with you? She yelled back in a more concerned and serious tone, in a voice that was slightly off of my mother's. This was the first thing that told me something just wasn't quite right. Our family never cared if anyone was over, as our house was a very open house to all my family and friends. Plus the voice, it was just wrong. It sounded like my mother's, but it was missing something that I couldn't quite put my finger on. Weirded out, I replied back. It's just Colton. After I yelled that back to her, I finally found a good place to hide the bottle and began walking up the steps to the next level. Now, as I was walking up those steps, I couldn't help but feel the overbearing silence of the house and the slight electric twinge that something was not right. When I got to the top of the steps, I look over to where the garage door was, and then also to the kitchen right next to it. It's black, pitch black. All the lights were off. There's no moon shining even through any of the windows. I walked over to the kitchen yelling out, Mom, where are you? There was no reply. Silence and darkness. I feel the electric twinge turn into full-on needles, and my adrenaline kicks in full force. I have to get out of here as fast as possible. My mother was not home. I run back down the stairs grabbing my coat along the way. Well, what's wrong, dude? Colton says. My mom's not home. I reply as fast as I can looking for my truck keys. What do you mean? You were just talking with her. I could see the confusion on his face. Dude, there's no one home. We need to leave now. I took a few steps towards the back door that opened up into the yard. Then I see my dog shaking on the couch and my cat growling behind it. I couldn't just leave them. I knew that if we left, something might happen. Are we leaving? Bolton said, still confused as hell. No, I, I can't leave them here alone. Something is really off though. I'm going to call my mom and figure this out. I pull out my phone and call my mother. She picks up immediately. Hey, sweetie, what's going on? She answers. 
Mom, were you just home? I heard you yelling for me from the second level. When I went up there, you weren't here, I said, hoping that she was playing some kind of joke. No, I'm just leaving the bar. I wasn't feeling very well. Are you okay? What do you mean you heard me? I fill her in on the whole story and she rushes home. Colton and I stayed in the basement with the animals until she got back. But before she did, you could hear something upstairs, not walking or sitting on things, but like a pressure in the air, like a black hole was slowly moving from one room to the next, and the word that I would instinctively describe it as is hungry. When she got home, you could feel the thing leave just as quick as it came, like an overbearing predator presence that had just flown away. We've still never figured out what the hell was going on, and this is just one of the many unexplainable things that's happened to us, but this is the easiest to write down, and the one I was happy to have a witness to. Unfortunately, my mother has passed away now, and I've moved away to Arizona, but whenever I go back to Iowa and I see Colton, he still gets creeped out by what happened. I will truly never know what exactly happened, but I know that whatever that was had my mother's voice, and it was evil and hungry.'